Good morning, everyone. I'm Michael O'Hanlon at the Foreign Policy Program of the Brookings Institution, and I would like to welcome you today, along with colleagues uh, Frank Rose and retired General Lori Robinson, to an event in which we are privileged to host General David Goldfein, the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, in what is now his last month as Chief of Staff in military service after a distinguished 37-year uh, career uh, where he's done so much in America's armed forces for the country and around the world. I would uh, like to say a couple more words by way of introduction. Our format today will then be that uh, General Robinson, who's a non-resident fellow with us and who spent much of her career with General Goldfein would like to offer a word of welcome and warm wishes and hello. And then we will come back and I'll pose a few questions to the general about how the Air Force is doing, how he looks back on his tenure as chief of staff and other jobs before that and the challenges before the Air Force that he'll be handing off to his successor. Frank Rose, my colleague at Brookings, will then uh, specialize in or hone in a bit more on the topics of strategic and space forces, which as you know, of course, is a particularly salient topic these days as we have just stood up or in the process of standing up the US uh, Space Force, which is largely coming out of Air Force capabilities. So General Goldfein has been at the center of that. And then finally, we will take your questions from the audience for the last 20 minutes or so of our hour. And if you still wanna write in with those questions by email, you could send them to events at brookings.edu. One more very broad uh, word of, of welcome. Brookings is of course a nonpartisan organization. We're here to discuss the US Air Force and military modernization. Uh, I am asked to inform that some people at Brookings may have affiliations with certain political campaigns and you can find those on the website. But of course that's not today's purpose and not the focus of uh, the Brookings Institution. So let me add a couple more thoughts about General Goldfein, who I've been privileged to know now for uh, at least a decade, and I think met probably 20 years ago for the first time. He graduated from the US Air Force Academy in 1983. He's a fighter pilot. He's served this with distinction throughout much of the world. His most particular areas of expertise have been uh, Europe and the broader Central Command Theater, but for also the last 10 to 12 years, he's been involved in key jobs in Washington, including the prestigious director of the Joint Staff, where he thought in a very ecumenical and joint way about all the challenges around the world. At just the moments when we started to see not only the continued problems in the broader Middle East region with ISIS and Al Qaeda and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, but also the increasing rise and resurgence of Russia and China, the return of great power competition. And he's certainly been at the forefront of the nation's response to all of that in the last uh, dozen years or so, not least, of course, in the last four as one of the members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the highest ranking military officer in the US Air Force. So uh, General Goldfein, it's just a great honor and pleasure to have you here. I just wanna thank you on behalf of all of us at Brookings and so many Americans for what you've done uh, for the country. And as I say, I have a friend, uh, your friend as well, General Robinson, who would now like to chime in with a couple of uh, warm wishes and words of her own. So, uh, Lori, if you're there, the floor is now over to you, please. Okay. First of all, it is an absolute honor to be a part of the introduction of my dear friend, uh, General Goldfein. Um, Michael, and I'm going to get um, emotional here. Uh, Michael and Frank are going to ask him the real hard policy questions, and I'll leave that to him. But I wanted to introduce him to all of you, to the entire audience, as an airman's airman. I had the privilege to work for General Goldfein in Qatar, and it was amazing just to watch him, all the airmen, just walk around him no matter where he went. I saw the same thing when he was the chief. Every time he went someplace, the airmen just flocked around him, wanted to listen to what he had to say, wanted to, to be a part of what he was bringing to our Air Force. His passion for our Air Force and our airmen is unsurpassed. His lens was always to look at what was best for our Air Force and our airmen and their readiness. You know, one of his greatest chief uh, famous saying is, wherever there's a challenge comes an opportunity. His positive outlook is so contagious. While General Goldfein is a personal friend and hero, I will tell you that Team Goldfein is unbeatable. Between the chief's personal touch for our airmen, Don's love for our Air Force family, she talks to each of the family members as their own. Team Robinson wants to thank you, Team Goldfein, that you made all of us understand that we're a part of something bigger than ourselves. You made all of us better. 
Your United States Air Force will miss Team Goldstein, but we're grateful for all that you've done. Have a great event with Brookings, and uh, Chief, we're so proud of you and Don. Team Robinson says congratulations. General Thanks Robinson, so much, Lori. Yeah, G General Goldfein, please, uh, on behalf of all of us, I just want to say thank you and congratulations, and we're really gl glad to have you join us today. Oh, thanks. And uh, boy, it doesn't get any better than having a uh, somebody that I admire, like uh, Lori Robinson, uh, who has been such an incredible role model for all of us. So thanks, Team Robinson. And by the way, I do want to come back yeah. in a few minutes, uh, General Goldfein, if I could, to the, sort of the people side of the Air Force, which, of course, mm -hmm. is as important as anything. And I know you feel that way. And that's been a big part of your job as chief is, is thinking about the people. And, of course, we have some special challenges in the country today. Um, that have really developed uh, over the last few weeks in particular. So uh, I'll, I'll be asking you to speak to that question of the sort of, you know, uh, well-being of the state of the people of the Air Force a little bit later. But let me begin, if I could, with just a broad question about the state of the Air Force writ large. You've been involved in a number of innovation and modernization efforts, everything from what's called the third offset to the return of great power competition. Now the national defense strategy that Secretary Mattis devised when he was running the Pentagon that you contributed to. There are Air Force concepts that have contributed to this like multi-domain operations and now a new concept for integrated command and control. And I wanna get into some specifics in a minute, but if I could just put that big question before you of how do you think about where the Air Force has come over these last four years, or if you wish over the last eight years since you were vice chief before you were chief. Just love to get your broad 30,000 foot view on where the Air Force has come in this time, please. Yeah, thanks, Michael. You know, uh, many of us uh, have been involved in war games over the last 10, like you say, 20 years since you and I have known each other. And and the scenario we often pick is the is the China scenario, uh, according with, the you know, in line with the national defense strategy. And for many years, they have not ended, ended well. You know, we've all walked away from those uh, war games thinking, okay, it's time to get back to the drawing board and say, take a look at what kind of a joint force do we need to field that can turn the results of these war games around. And of course, we always play against our best assessment of the threat uh, based on where we see them investing and moving. So we ran about 2,000 iterations of uh, various force elements, uh, and we came up with a force that actually did quite well. For the first time, by the way, that I've seen in a number of years, and it, it it highlighted for me as chief early in my tenure that there were four key areas that we had to invest in if we were going to build this force that we need to be able to compete, deter, and if deterrence fails, win. And those four key areas are number one, uh, space. It was never a guarantee that if you moved first in space that you were going to win. You know, winning, as Secretary Mattis used to say, winning on the battlefield is not an American birthright. You got to earn it. But in every game we played, if you moved, to, if you were the second mover, you lost. So it became fairly clear to us that our first level of investment we had to make in was in space superiority. That was number one. Number two was connecting this force in ways that it's not currently connected. And this is not F-22s and F-35s talking to each other. This is an F-35 talking to a B-52 that's, you know, 100 years old, to an X-37 that's, you know, that's in low Earth orbit or other orbits, to a Marine Air Ground Task Force, to a brigade combat team, and to a tactical submarine that's operating off of uh, adversary shores. Today, our systems are not optimized to be able to operate simultaneously together in, uh, in all domain operations. And so that was the second area of investment that I will probably spend a little time on today that we had to move into. The third area was we fought, you know, elements from afar, you know, standoff versus stand in, penetrating versus standoff. And we tried all of one and we tried all of another. Neither of them actually succeeded. The one that succeeded was the hybrid approach that said there are some portions of the joint team that has to penetrate, persist, proliferate, protect, and punish the adversary. And there's some portion of the force that has to stand off and be outside of the threat area. And so getting that hybrid force right was the third element of investment. And the fourth one was assuming that logistics will be under attack 
which is not something we faced for in the last 19 years. Let's be honest. I've been able to flow whatever forces I needed into theater in whatever time frame or mode I wanted, and I was never under attack. That's a false assumption for future conflict. So we found that if we could invest in those four key areas, we could build a force that actually could turn the, the, the outcome of the war games around in the most stressing scenarios. The only way to pay for that is to get rid of those, that, those things that don't play well and don't play heavily in that 2030 fight. That's the path that the service has been on. It is a, uh, it is a difficult sell on the hill because what I'm pre preaching is highways in a truck town. And, uh, and I have yet to find a highway lobbyist, uh, but I sure have found a lot of truckers. And so trying to get us to think about digital engineering and architecture and common data as the currency of future warfare has been this four year mantra that we've been on. I would say that uh, I'm pretty satisfied with where we've landed. This is a tough conversation. And we learned long ago that if, you, if you're trying to sell it with PowerPoint and lightning bolts, um, it's all aspirational and it will get no uh, support. When you bring real capability to bear and show real, real impact with combat capability, you can't talk about a cloud, you gotta build one. Can't talk about data architecture, you gotta build that. You can't have lightning bolts, you gotta build these things. So we have been able to demonstrate performance over these course these four years. And so I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty happy with where we are right now as an Air Force and as a joint team going forward. That's a fantastic framing. And I wanted, if I could, to bear down a little bit more and ask you, you already mentioned the three or four key areas uh, like space satellite survivability and command and control interconnectivity and being able to move quickly. But I wanted to also see if we could bring it even down one level below to more specifics about either the kinds of doctrines that and ideas that you pushed that you think were most important, whether it's the third offset under the previous administration and the beginning of your tenure, whether it is the multi-domain operations concept that you have really pushed along with the army, as I understand the origins of that, mm -hmm. whether it's with this new command and control construct where I think the Air Force is in the lead, maybe you want to say a word about that. So broad concepts, doctrines, and how they, you know, how they actually have concrete specific manifestations, that would be one way to look at my question. The other would be, can you give a couple of examples of specific types of hardware that, uh, that are unclassified that you're able to speak about today that you've managed to bring fairly far along in the development and fielding process? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Michael. You know, part of our challenge, of course, is that we've, we've uh, done the usual thing and we've now got acronym soup. Uh, you know, I mean, so, you know, four years ago, I walked out on stage at the, my first speech at AFA and said, this is all about multi-domain operations, multi-domain command and control. We're partnered with the other services and we're moving out. And then uh, it wasn't about a, two months later, I went over to London and delivered a speech. And that, 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 you know, you plant seeds as a chief, right? Sometimes those seeds, those ideas hit fertile soil and sometimes they hit rocks, right? And so in NATO, it hit fertile soil. And from that became multi-domain command and control centers of excellence and things we were doing. And then along the way, we went from multi-domain operations to all domain operations. Then we went to join all domain operations to join all domain command and control. And I don't, it doesn't surprise me if we have folks out there who are just a con bit confused about, you know, the acronym soup that we have going on. But let me just share with you that it's all one and the same. The concept is this, uh, the days of, of sequential warfare, where we would come in perhaps as an air component and beat down the defenses and build up naval and land forces over some period of time and then roll in with a land campaign, I think those are uh, that is an outdated uh, framework for future warfare. The side that wins is going to have a couple of things. Number one, it's going to have access to data information and deny the, that to the, the adversary and it will be operating at speeds that we have not had to operate in the last 19 years. If you think about it, it's almost unparalleled in history how much control we have had over the rheostat of time in conflict. I mean, 
you probably remember this, right? We all do. We announced to the enemy six months before we went back and went, went into Mosul when we were coming, how we were coming, where we were coming from, and there was nothing they could do about it. Such is the nature of, of controlling time as an element of warfare. Uh, time is going to be the key attribute that we're going to have to master in the next one. And we're going to have to operate at machine speeds to operate at the speeds to counter our adversaries and, in fact, cause them to dilemmas that we need to cause them so that they question and pause long enough to wonder whether they can actually achieve their military objectives or political objectives using military force, hence deterrence in the 21st century. So going back to, to demonstrating capability versus aspirational PowerPoint. So one of our first demonstrations, and oh, by the way, one of the first guys I talked to uh, when we started down this path four years ago was Eric Schmidt, you know, coming out of Google. And he had two pieces of advice. He said, number one, he says, Dave, don't eat the entire elephant. It will crush you with its weight and, uh, and you will not get anywhere. He goes, pick a, a smaller edible animal and then go after it. And he said, and, and uh, no more PowerPoint, no more lightning bolts. Just start demonstrating success. Success breeds future success. So that, that gave, became the foundation of where we went forward. So I'll, I'll describe the first uh, demonstration. And I'll do this all, of this, all in unclassified terms. <clears throat> we took a space asset. We built the algorithms. All of these were, by the way, on common uh, digital uh, architecture and common data framework, right? So un un uninhibited access to data between all of these systems. We put an enemy naval vessel in the Gulf of New Mexico. This is all live fly, by the way. Uh, put an enemy naval vessel in the Gulf. We put a space asset, gave it the algorithms, built into it and said, okay, see if you can find the vessel. It did, but it couldn't get ID uh, criteria, couldn't get identification, and it couldn't get uh, decision quality or target quality coordinates. So it passed it to a penetrating ISR asset who, who went in, put its sensors on it, 95% confidence of ID, target quality coordinates, passed that to a C2 asset that had built into it the full algorithms for what the commander's intent was from non-kinetic through kinetic, chose an Aegis cruiser, sent the data to the Aegis cruiser, the Aegis cruiser team got the data, validated it, and then took the shot. What's most important about that kill chain I just described is that the first human in that loop was the Aegis cruiser shooter. Everything else occurred at machine speeds. And the only time required to close that kill chain was the time it took for the penetrating ISR asset to get close enough to use its sensors. Had we had more ubiquitous sensing, it would have even cut that time down. That gives you a sense of the speed of warfare that we have got to achieve. The challenge and the opportunity is that, again, I'm, I'm, I'm talking highways and trying to sell this in a truck town. And, and most of the trucks that I'm trying to uh, get rid of to be able to buy the highway and the networking that we need have got constituency, right? They've got, uh, they've got jobs associated with them. And, and the other challenge we have is that it wouldn't surprise anybody listening that the Air Force of all the services has the largest portfolio of classified programs. And much of what we are doing here is in the classified realm. So I'm going to the Hill. I've got, I've tripled my number of engagements in, in classified settings with members and staff and when, when I sit down with them and I explain where we're headed, it's an aha moment. They say, okay, I get it. So it's been this. So when we talk about joint all domain operations and joint all domain command and control, this is not about big screens and a big headquarters like, you know, Lori and I uh, ran together. This is distributed. It's, it's resilient. It's had multiple pathways to communicate and it allows us to close thousands of kill chains in hundreds of hours and take humans from being in the loop where we have them today to on the loop where we need them to only do what humans need to do. This has been the central feature of moving forward into joint all domain operations. And, uh, and I, th here's the good news. I'm no longer in any discussions in this building with our international teammates or on the Hill. Uh, in the last six months to a year, I have not had one discussion about whether we should do this. Every discussion I'm having is how we do this. That's progress. 
It's fantastic. And I know Frank's going to follow up on a couple of the specifics that you just alluded to when I pass the baton to him. But first, I have two more questions for you. And one is about the budget environment. One's going to be about the people of the Air Force and how you see that. On the budget, uh, I think the last time you and I were, uh, when I was lucky to have you at Brookings a couple of years ago, these were sort of headier times for the budget. And the defense budget had been boosted up quite a bit. Uh, even before the COVID crisis, we saw the Trump administration's projections for longer term defense spending essentially flat at a time when General Dunford, the previous chairman, and when the Independent uh, Commission on the National Defense Strategy of 2018 had all basically said you need real dollar growth of three to five percent per year into the indefinite future to really build the kind of defense program and sustain it. Uh, and again, even before COVID, the Trump administration wasn't projecting that. Secretary Esper joined us at Brookings two months ago for a format like this, at which he said that his guess was that COVID may put further downward pressure on the uh, defense budget. And so uh, without asking you to prognosticate about that, I just wondered if there were a couple of areas within the broader defense space or the Air Force in particular that you saw as places we could afford perhaps, if necessary, to cut back uh, even above and beyond the plans that you have already put in place, whether it's in the size of the military, whether it's in certain kinds of capabilities, whether we can delay certain weapons programs, whether we could curtail the F-35. Is there anything that you would put on the chopping block if, you know, maybe under protest, but nonetheless that you would see as uh, something we could make do without if absolutely necessary, albeit at greater risk? Over to you. Yeah, so thank I, you. know, I don't think any, I don't think anyone uh, certainly nobody I've talked to is project, projecting uh, budget growth. Everyone is projecting flatline as the best uh, as the best outcome and likely uh, budget decline. And so for me, that makes it even more important that we don't miss the opportunity we have right now to getting the digital engineering and the data architecture right. Because the future, you know, I, I'm often asking, well, so, you know, future of the Air Force, is it manned, unmanned? Is it, is it penetrating? Is it standoff? Is it, you know, attributable, unattributable? Um, you know, is it conventional, unconventional? And the answer is it's all of the above. Uh, the future of the Air Force is going to have an, a 100-year-old B-52 flying in the same time as a two-year-old uh, uh, X-37 that's going to be flying with a, uh, an, I don't know how many year old Aegis cruiser that's going to be uh, flying at the same time as a brand new unmanned submarine. And we're going to have in all the services, all of these attributes, some that are legacy and some that are new. And so what industry has learned that we have got to follow is that you actually can't skip the step of digital engineering and data architecture. You know, we, we tend to throw and some throw out, and I tell this to members of Congress, I say, hey, when somebody comes over here and throws out the game changers, artificial intelligence, hypersonics, directed energy, quantum, you know, and they are all game changers. I said, hey, ask the next important question. Exactly what data are you planning on accessing to do artificial intelligence? And how are you going to get that? Okay, let's talk about hypersonics. Exactly how are you going to find, fix, and then finish with a long-range hypersonic weapon? How are you going to get mid-course guidance against a moving target? How are you going to, and, and what, you, what you find sometimes is it's a miracle spike on the, on the program chart, right, that has to occur when all the planets align. Actually, it's not a miracle. You got to do it. You got you to invest in it. You know, Google did not come an AI company before they got their digital architecture right. And, and they didn't you'd be, become an AI uh, company until they first uh, got common access to data. So what I've told the secretary and others, I said, you know, if you want to talk uh, what, what you can do for all of your successors is get this foundational set right. And then everything that follows will connect to open mission system and heck, I don't know sitting here what's going to go in the bay of that B-52 or the bay of that X-37 or the tube of that tactical submarine. And I don't have to. I just know if we can connect it, 
there's going to be a some there's going to be a young soldier sailor airman marine who are going to figure this out and they are going to cause china uh, a world of problems and that's what we got to do and so you know for me i can't tell you a single platform sensor or weapon that i'm all that fired up about um, i got plenty of trucks uh, that's not a problem for me i need highways i need i need I need resilient pathways to communicate, to change the cost curve, because right now it is so much more expensive to defend than it is to attack. Whether you want to talk bases or cyber or what have you, we got to flip that curve. And industry actually is ahead of us in this, and and I think uh, is is going to help us uh, get to where we need to go. But this is the time to do it, especially facing tough budgets ahead. Fantastic. Thank you. And my last question is about the people of the Air Force who are incredible. I'll say that and volunteer that, and I'm sure you agree. But I do want to ask about sort of the state of diversity. And I mean diversity in a pretty broad way, three specific ways. One, of course, you're about to be succeeded by an African-American chief of staff, which is a fantastic moment for the Air yep. Force and for the country. That's very good news. We had Lori Robinson on earlier, retired General Robinson, who was the first woman in US military history to head a combatant command when she was in uniform, that's great news. The Air Force, I believe, has been better than the other services at having four-star women in its ranks, which is also good news. On the other hand, there aren't many um, women or African-Americans sort of at the senior ranks who might be coming in next. And uh, the other area where I'm curious about your thoughts on diversity is for, let's say, the it's especially mothers, but fathers and mothers who may want to leave the Air Force for a while during child raising years and then come back. And to what extent has the military been innovative enough about allowing a break in service and then welcoming back people who may want to rejoin? I realize that may not be a huge population group, but it strikes me as an important one. So on any aspect of those personnel questions, I would love to hear your thoughts, please, sir. Yeah, thanks, Michael. You know, two things happened with the brutal killing of George Floyd. Something broke on the streets of America and America responded as Americans do, uh, which is to gather together and protest a wrong. But the second thing that happened is something broke loose in the United States Air Force. And what broke loose is an opportunity for us to make long-term meaningful and lasting change that quite frankly, um, we should have been doing before. And I take that completely on me. We, uh, we, you know, we were doing a lot of work towards becoming a more diverse force, but I think we have the opportunity in front of us right now to go to put our, you know, put on the gas and really move forward in ways that we need to move. I look at the United States Air Force as the big tent service. And I'm not saying this parochially, I just say this as a, as a, as a joint chief. Um, we're the Big Ten service because we have the most diverse mission set. So we do leaflets to nukes and everything in between. We operate from below the surface in a missile uh, launch facility to the outer reaches of space now with our Space Force and, and every domain in between. And so if you think about it from, uh, you know, a set of card tables in a high school gym and a recruiter behind each card table, the question is, what kid, what kind of kid lines up between each card table, right? I think you can actually sort of pick out the kids that would want to become the few, the proud, right? The Marines or the kids who want to go out there and be more than they can, you know, do more, be, you know, be all you can be, you know, army of one. I mean, we, I think we can, we can, uh, we can think of that. So in the Air Force li line, um, I got to be a service where the first person in line is a young woman and she wants to be a pilot always dreamed of flying. And so she's got to see herself in us. And our culture has got to embrace her in ways that she feels completely part of this organization. And the next kid in line is that, you know, this kid that wants to, you know, attack the enemy in cyber and is just fascinated by cyber. And the next kid in line wants to do things in space. The next kid wants to be an elite defender to guard nuclear weapons. And the next kid wants to, you know, uh, uh, being there, you know, you name it, right? So we have such a diverse mission set <clears throat> that we ought to be the big tent service that attracts, you know, uh, people from all walks of life and all backgrounds. And we ought to be the very best 
uh, in the world at diversity, and we're not, but we can be. And so the measures that uh, that we put in place um, that we're working on are long-term uh, aggressive measures to change the de- change change the demographic to ensure that we are building a culture of inclusiveness at the squadron level, which is where it matters most, and that we are arming command teams with the tools they need to shift this. And as I've told commanders, and I've got another one going out to them uh, this afternoon, I say, you know, history is not on our side here. If we follow history, we'll get, we'll get a few things going, and then September will arrive and COVID will return, and flu season will start, and hurricane season will hit. It's expected to be particularly bad, and wildfires will begin, and the election will go into high gear, and we will get distracted, and we will put this on the back burner. Shame on us if we let that happen. And so what I've, I've talked to commanders across the Air Force and said, let's commit right now to... to uh, making history wrong on this one, that we have the staying power to take the actions that we need to um, going forward. General Brown, I will tell you that, you know, a few years ago, I started watching all my four stars, knowing that that uh, it was time to start looking for and, and grooming and, and my successor. And so I put, uh, I put them up uh, in front of other airmen on the stage at AFA, got a chance to sort of watch them in action. And then uh, it became very clear to me that the that the, the most capable officer I had on my team to step in to replace me was uh, was CQ Brown, uh, just an unbelievable officer. Um, if you look at his background, you won't find one. Quite frankly, that's that's better. Uh, he is commanded. I mean, think about just this part, right? So here, here's a guy who's commanded in in Europe, commanded in Central Command, and now commanding in the Pacific. He knows every international air chief from Africa and Europe with a personal relationship, every international air chief in the Middle East and every international air chief in the Pacific uh, and Indo-PACOM. He's operated as a deputy commander of a combatant command in combat as CENTCOM. He's been the aide to the chief of staff of the Air Force. I mean, this is a guy whose who's resume is just spectacular. And, uh, and the, the wonderful thing is um, he, he and Shireen are an incredible team. So it's going to be fun actually to hand the flag to uh, a good friend and a great, great officer to take this Air Force to, to uh, newer heights. Thank you very much. Is there a date for that transition already set, by the way? 6 August. And thank you again for so much you've done and for the great answers to my questions. Frank, over to you. Great. Thanks very much, Mike. Um, let me, General, echo Mike and Lori's comments by thanking you for your outstanding service to the nation. Uh, your leadership and vision for the Air Force will certainly be missed. And on a personal note, let me thank you for the great cooperation that you and I had when I was at the State Department and you were the AFSENT commander when we were working with the Gulf uh, Coalition on integrated air and missile defense. So thank you for that. And I'm so delighted that you'll be leaving the Air Force in such capable hands as General Brown, uh, who I first met when he was your deputy at AFSA. Uh, I think that's just a, a great appointment. So my questions this morning focus on two areas, nuclear and outer space. And, and let's start with nuclear specifically the nuclear modernization program. Now, critics of the current modernization program argue the program is too expensive, unnecessary, and potentially destabilizing. The two most controversial elements of the modernization program are Air Force programs, specifically the ground-based strategic deterrent intercontinental ballistic missile and the long-range standoff nuclear cruise missile. General, I was wondering if you could take a few minutes to explain why you believe it's important for the United States to continue with the current modernization program 
especially the ground-based strategic deterrent and the long-range standoff cruise missile. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Frank. And I'll, I'll just put, I'll just frame my answer uh, looking primarily at Russia because it's Russia that I think of most often when I think of the nuclear threat for two reasons. Number one, they've just completed their own modernization of their own triad. And number two, uh, they have military leaders up to Gerasimov who speak openly about the use and the introduction of nuclear weapons in conflict. And they talk about tactical nuclear weapons, which I believe there's no such thing, right? Once you go nuclear, you're no longer tactical. So in that, in that framework of a country that uh, has modernized ahead of us and talks about their use, now let's talk about the triad. I, I, there's two things that I tell uh, members of Congress when I'm asked on this issue and anybody else. I say there's two. My best military advice on this issue is two things. Number one. Don't give up something for nothing. Don't unilaterally disarm when you get nothing in return. That's, that would be bad policy. That would be bad. Uh, I would never as a military leader uh, uh, recommend that we would unilaterally disarm and get nothing for it in return. And number two, never give up your second strike capability. One of the reasons we have 400 weapons buried in the Northern tier is that no country on the planet has what it needs to take them all out. They're too deep. They don't know where they all are. And so therefore we always, always in every scenario have the opportunity to strike back, which in fact becomes the foundation of deterrence. Should we get rid of that leg without going into classified, but you're uh, particularly aware, um, our second strike capability is in jeopardy. And I would never as a military leader ever uh, recommend that we do that. Each leg of the triad was designed <clears throat> for a particular reason. Uh, and without all three legs, you would have to significantly change the STRATCOM commander's uh, war, war plans. And you would have to uh, significantly uh, in, impact, you know, targets that today uh, we hold at risk for the commander in chief. And so uh, it, it is going to be costly. Uh, there's no doubt about that. This is this, the, you know, what's, what's going to be a challenge. And I think a debate is that this will be the first time that the nation has tried to simultaneously modernize the nuclear enterprise while it's trying to modernize an aging conventional enterprise. The current budget does not allow you to do both. And so there are either going to be some significant trades made or we're going to have to find a fund for strategic nuclear deterrence that we can use to modernize, which is the way we did it before uh, back in the Reagan era. So I would just uh, offer that in my mind, uh, I could never advise anybody to unilaterally disarm or give up second strike capability. And I do believe we have to have a debate about the way we're going to fund this uh, essential part of our, our military going forward. Over. Great. Thanks very much, General. Let's now pivot to, to space. Um, General, throughout your tenure as Chief of Staff, you've spoken eloquently about the importance of outer space. Indeed, that's what you started off with this morning. Uh, last year, as you know, Congress made the decision to establish the United States Space Force. So my question to you is this. Uh, first, can you describe how you are working with General Raymond, the Chief of Space Operations, to ensure an effective transition of space personnel and capabilities from the Air Force to the Space Force? And, and second, uh, despite the decision to create the Space Force, the air and space domains will remain closely interrelated. Indeed, that's the reason why the Air Force was initially assigned the mission in the first place. So as we stand up the Space Force, what steps should be taken to ensure effective coordination and integration between the air domain and the space domain? Thanks very yeah. much. 
Thanks, Frank. So I've been on my own personal journey on this, and it, and anyone listening could go back and find my opening statements when this uh, all began uh, several years ago. And I was concerned about it, to be honest with you. And my concerns were based on the fact that we had come so far as an institution on integrating space and air and cyber in terms of joint war fighting, that I was afraid that in our, in our quest to build a separate service, we would separate space from the war fight and we would lose that joint integration that we achieved. And so uh, there, it wasn't until I went down to Maxwell Air Force Base and sat down with our Shriver scholars. And these are young majors we send there for a PhD in space. And as I'm talking through, you know, th uh, thoughts on a few subjects, I'm watching the body language and, uh, and it wasn't that positive, uh, pretty tense in the room. So I finally, I asked them, these, you know, a bunch of young majors, I said, hey, so show of hands, um, how many of you think that it's time now to, to, to have a separate service for space? And every hand went up without a hesitation. And so that was a, that was a important moment for me as chief, because these are my airmen telling me something, speaking truth to power. So I started listening, reading, talking, uh, uh, talking, I spent a lot of time, uh, went, went to every, uh, all, both of our launch facilities and spent a lot of time with industry. And I came to the conclusion that, uh, that when I look at the, the bandwidth of a chief of staff of an Air Force, and I ask myself the question, who would move space forward faster? A chief of staff of an Air Force that does leaflets to nukes and everything in between? that has got the full range of missions or a service chief that is singularly focused on space, harnessing the, 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 the exponential improvements and advancement in the commercial space business. And it became clear to me that, that the, the time to build a service was now, that the president has this right, that a chief of a service that's focused on space is gonna move faster than a chief of a service that's focused on Again, the entire multi-domain part of an Air Force. So I got behind it. And once I became a believer, um, I got behind it full force. And my job, I believe, is to find the sweet spot between maintaining that integration of joint warfighting between air and space, but yet allowing this separate service to develop its own culture because we could hug it too close and slow it down. And that's what General Raymond and I have been focused on. And my job is to make him and his new service successful within the Department of the Air Force. And so we're working together uh, hand in hand. It, it helps that we've sort of grown up together, known each other for years. I have great respect and admiration for, uh, for my fellow chief. Um, but because I'm a firm believer that this is the right way to go, it's actually been easy to get behind it uh, and make sure. And so we've, we've agreed that, uh, you know, we may disagree, but we'll never be disagreeable. And uh, our services know that there is no air between us. And uh, the the typical bureaucratic battles, bureaucratic battles that would occur between two services, are just not going to occur um, to the level that we're going to uh, be able to allow them. Final thing on this. So I have this picture that I I love to show, which has got uh, me holding my two granddaughters, Ava and Ray, who just turned two. And they don't know this, but I've done the math, and they are members of the class of 2040 at the Air Force Academy. And, uh, and they don't know this either, but one of them will join the Air Force, and one of them will join the Space Force. And on that day, when they walk across that stage to get their diplomas, the class of 2020 will be graded. And the, cl the question for us, us all here today, members of the class of 2020, is what did we build? Did we build two services forged on a foundation of trust, confidence, and focused on joint warfighting and moving space superiority and air superiority forward together? Or do we allow this to become a divisive split uh, with, the, with the tensions and the distrust that occurs when there's a nasty divorce uh, over the years? Shame on us if we let that happen. And I will tell you, Chief Raymond and I are not going to let that happen. Thanks very much, General. Mike, let me turn the floor back over to you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Frank. And General, now a few questions that I'm gonna to try to condense because we have a dozen or more from the audience and we don't have time for all that. But a couple of people who are curious, building on the issue of people 
and the, the state of uh, airmen and airwomen in the Air Force about uh, efforts that you're making on uh, the diversity front, picking up on my last question, but if there are a couple of specific things you could add about what you're trying to do to improve diversity, or maybe the even more pointed way to say it is to improve the promotion prospects for your diverse uh, population across many different genders and races, because of course you have a pretty representative Air Force at younger levels, I think, relative to American society. But as people go up in the ranks, uh, sometimes um, there's less. And then another question was about pilots and whether you have enough, whether you're competing with the airline industry, maybe it's not gonna be as hard to compete with the airline industry now. Uh, we don't, normally in an economic downturn, it's a little easier for the military to recruit and retain but I wondered if you could speak to those two questions about people, please. Absolutely. So first, let's talk uh, officer development and, and NCO development. I'll, I'll spend, uh, I'll, I'll focus on officer development. Um, so we are in the uh, about, about, about complete to the largest overhaul of the officer development and promotion system in the history of the Air Force. Last time it was touched was about 1982. And so in the first year, I went out and we did uh, extensive surveys to the force on uh, on areas. And one of the areas we looked at was officer development and promotion. And what came back was uh, not a lot of trust and quite frankly, a lot of, not a lot of understanding on what we value as an institution and how do we promote based on what it is that we value. And so the foundation of our, um, of our officer development and promotion system is, is based on four key core competencies of every officer. Number one, how do you perform the mission? Number two, how do you lead the people entrusted to your care? Number three, how do you manage the resources required to accomplish your mission? And number four, in the rating period, how well have you personally improved your unit? Those are the four core competencies of an airman, an officer in the United States Air Force. And I would say for an NCO as well. And those four competencies ride on a foundation of impeccable character because the nation expects us to be men and women of impeccable character because we ride for the brand. And not only do we ride for the brand, but we also you know, will turn a key and launch a nuclear missile. And that requires a level of character uh, at a very high level. And so based on those four core competencies, we went then took a look at it and, and, and you can now thread back to those competencies and everything we've done. We took the one uh, large single line of the Air Force promotion and development category and split it into now six categories to allow us to, to tailor the development of an officers against what we truly value as an institution. And the, the previous process, everyone was competing against pilots. And so you had to do the same things a pilot did, regardless of whether that was what we, had, we value as a service. You know, so for instance, if you're a space officer, um, you would think that it would be obvious. We would value a year with industry doing work with SpaceX or uh, orbital AG, you know, orbital or somewhere. But there was no time for that in the previous system. So we busted up the development categories. We got rid of below the zone promotions, um, which is, which as you might imagine, was a rather significant uh, emotional change for the Air Force. But I found that we were one of the few institutions as part of professional development, that the first time we identified someone who has high potential, that we would remove time from their career for development. We would just advance them faster and faster and faster. And, is that, and it set up some, some behaviors that quite frankly did not align with the four core competencies of what we're looking at. So uh, long way of saying we have, we have completely overhauled our officer development and promotion system over the last two, uh, three years. And I think it's going to produce that force that we need that aligns with the all domain operations that we talked about in the beginning. Because the technology is great, but you got to have the people to be able to accomplish the mission. When it comes to pilots, um, <clears throat> we've basically been sort of holding our own, quite frankly. No, it's not significantly improved, not significantly uh, degraded. We have about 2,000 shortage. We've carried that shortage uh, over the past couple of years. Um, we rarely talk about the denominator. That's 2,000 of 25,000, just to put it in perspective, that we're short. So we just continue to manage it. We are seeing that the airlines uh, are not hiring. 
And so we have uh, greater retention. But to me, it's about a quality. This is about quality of service. We got to make sure that we, and we are doing a lot to make flying in the United States Air Force as rich an experience as we can make it. And if we could make it rich for that airman and, their, and that airman's family, and this is more than pilots, this is air battle managers, this is, you know, our air, our air crew. If we can make uh, flying in the United States Air Force as rich an experience as we can for all the reasons that someone signed up to join the United States Air Force, we're going to keep them longer. And then you asked about, uh, about what I call, um, um, you know, being able to you know, manage your career through what I call full-time, part-time, right? So I'm full-time. <clears throat> I come on active duty. I decided I wanted to take some time off. I got a sick child, a sick parent. I've got uh, something in my life that's going on. I want to raise a, a family, right? Can I go part-time? The answer is yes. What's not as easy as when you, when life changes and you want to come back to full-time, that's actually a harder thing to do. And so what we're working through permeability and when Congress is helping us with the laws on this is to allow an officer and an NCO, but primarily an officer to go through a career, go from full-time to part-time and come back to full-time. To do it and remain competitive, you gotta change your year group because if you, if you stay with your original year group, you're no longer competitive. And we gotta be able to make that change through components far easier than it is today. And so we're working on legislation to allow that to, uh, to happen. Fantastic. Thank you. There are a few questions that pick up on the conversation you and I were having earlier about the relative priorities of different things and your, your comment, you need more highway and you're, you got plenty of trucks, which then leads some people to ask, well, if you need to persuade Congress to cut a couple of specific programs, are there any candidates, things that you would welcome keeping, uh, but maybe don't have the money for, you know, above and beyond the A-10 debate, although you can talk about that too, but any kind of uh, legacy systems, anything specific that would be a good place to pick up the conversation about priorities. Well, you gotta, you gotta start with, uh, <clears throat> just sort of take a look at where we are as an Air Force. So when we, you know, when I went to, to, to war as a captain in Desert Storm, we were an Air Force of just shy of a million uh, Air Act, Active Guard Reserve and Civilian Airmen, just shy of a million. And we had about 8,500 aircraft in the inventory. Um, today we have 600, about 690,000 down from just shy of a million airmen. And we have just over 5,000 aircraft, you know, down from 8,500. So, you know, 300,000 airmen and 3,000 aircraft just around the numbers have left the Air Force. So we're not the Air Force of Desert Storm. So when you start talking about, okay, well, then what of those remaining five, you know, 5,000 would you give up? Now you perhaps understand why I'm not looking at killing an entire weapon system, but I am looking at aggressively fleet managing. And the way you do fleet management is you identify uh, in each weapon system, those tail numbers that are the oldest and the most expensive to keep flying. And you retire those, you flow that money back into the remaining aircraft in that weapon system to the, to, to the modernization to keep them flying longer. And then you take what's left over and you buy the highway that that weapon system has to ride on. And so that's been the strategy through 21. You'll see that again in 22. Um, <clears throat> that's why you see some number of A-10s we're fleet managing. There's some number of tails that are cost prohibitive to re-wing. And so we're going to keep the A-10 flying through the late 30s, maybe into 2040. I just don't want to fly all of them. So I want to retire some number. I want to manage that fleet. I want to retire 17 B1s. I'm not retiring the entire B1 fleet, but I got 17 that are cost prohibitive. I'm going to manage them by tail number. I'm going to put them in the boat yard. I have some number of old RQ4s that I want to do the same thing with. I got some number of C-130Hs, right? So this is, this is aggressive fleet management on weapon systems that don't play as heavily in the 2030 uh, fight as other weapon systems. And then what of course we can't talk about is that it's not all minus, but I can't talk in open about many of the pluses because we're buying a lot of classified capability to, uh, that is, that is going to drive the Chinese and Russians crazy that we will reveal at a time and place of our choosing. There were a few questions about specific modernization programs, and I'm just going to summarize and talk about three. 
whether you have anything to say as you're leaving this job and have worked through the F-35 program, the centerpiece of Air Force tactical modernization, uh, whether you have any comments on that program. There was a sort of critical question about the state of the KC-46 tanker, which uh, the, uh, the person who asked the question had some concerns about quality control. Uh, and then finally, uh, the B-21, uh, that process was down selected on your watch and is now still in a fairly early phase. But since that's such a central platform for long range uh, stealth capability, I wondered if you had any comments on the state of that program, please. Yeah, thanks, Mike. So F-35, um, uh, I was very concerned uh, a few years ago about the cost of sustainment. And my sense was that we had not we had not built the infrastructure to scale to the size of the buy when it came to parts flow and flying hour costs. And I was pretty blunt and specific to all the CEOs uh, in a letter I sent to them. The, uh, I, was, I was told they, they called it the email heard around the world. When I sent an uh, uh, email to all the CEOs and to the joint program office, and I said, look, I'm gonna get a pretty specific question on the Hill. And I have between now and when I appear to figure out an answer to this question. And the question is, Chief, why should we buy you more F-35s when you can't afford to sustain the ones you have? And I need a, an answer to that question. And so we laid out some specific uh, avenues that we have to go down to be able to drive the sustainment costs down to the high end of, the, of a fourth generation and this is not about just about the Air Force. This is me as a joint chief speaking on behalf of my Marine and Navy counterparts and as an international air chief speaking on behalf of my international teammates uh, who are in the F-35 or those who want to get into the F-35. And so uh, I'm happy to say that the industry took that uh, letter seriously and as did the joint program office. And I've seen a, a rather significant change in behavior that I wasn't seeing, quite frankly, a few years back. And I've now twice taken 27 stars to the Lockheed Martin headquarters to do a full day review of where we're going on just sustainment. And, uh, and I'm, I, I'm pretty, I'm actually very, very happy with, uh, with the turn that they've made. And I say that because I've always been happy with how the aircraft is performing operationally. It's doing really well. I mean, and the best example I can give you is my uh, Israeli counterpart, uh, Amikam Norikam, who, who called me after uh, he was flying it in Israel. And he said, Dave, he goes, I'm, I'm no longer integrating the F-35 into my Air Force. I'm integrating my Air Force into the F-35. That's the nature of fusion, which in the end is what defines fifth generation. On the KC-46, I've flown it twice. Uh, like everyone, I was very, very, very frustrated with where we we're headed. Uh, three days after uh, new C CEO, Dave Calhoun, got in place, I wrote him a letter. Um, he came to see me. We had a very frank uh, conversation, and I asked him for a couple things. I said, listen, I'm not seeing the resources being placed against this program that need to be uh, placed. I'm no longer interested in uh, half measures when it comes to remote visual system. And quite frankly, I'm not seeing the talent from the company on this program that I should be seeing. And he committed to me in the office that, that he would fix it. And he has been a man of his word. And so we reached uh, what I believe is a really good compromise solution on a engineering design uh, that is going to turn that remote visual system into exactly what it should have been all along. I'm not happy with the fact that it will take us, you know, a couple more years to do it, but I understand why that's, that's required. And so we're on a path right now on the KC-46 that is very similar to the early days of the C-17. Anybody who's listening uh, who was part of the C-17 program in the, in the beginning, it was a mess. I mean, it was a, it was a nun McCurdy poster child, and we almost lost that program a number of times. But nobody remembers that. Right now, we look at the C-17. Everybody flies it. It's unbelievable. It's probably one of the most important weapon systems we've ever fielded. Um, and it's just a spectacular. It is, it is the, the heartbeat of global mobility. But nobody remembers those early days. The KC-46, I'm convinced, will be a weapon system that we're all proud of. 
Uh, I've flown it twice. Uh, it's going to be a significant part of the network that we've been talking about uh, this entire hour. And so I'm far more confident today in the performance and the behavior of Boeing on the KC-46 than I ever been. I have than I have been in my entire time here. And I give the new CEO a lot of credit for being a man of his word. And on the B-21, I just went out uh, a couple weeks ago and took a look at it. I'm actually taking the deputy secretary and the vice chairman out uh, next week. Uh, we're going to go take a look at it. Of all, the, of all the programs that we have now in the United States Air Force, I will tell you that uh, if you were to ask me to rack and stack them, I put B-21 at the very top. Uh, in terms of uh, contractor performance, in terms of uh, in the, the culture of what I see when I go visit, and, uh, and and you know being able to deliver on the performance parameters that we have put in place, uh, I uh, I'm really very happy with uh, with the way the B21 is going right now. Over. General, we're very grateful. There are a few more questions, but I want to respect your time. We've had a great hour with you. We've had a great four years. Uh, lucky to have you running the Air Force. And, and again, many more years before that uh, with various kinds of service to your nation. So thank you on behalf of all of Brookings and the whole country. Uh, good luck to you. And I hope you get a little bit of a break after August 6th uh, before you embark on the next chapter of life. But uh, speaking for Frank and myself and General Allen, our president and everybody else, best wishes and thank you again. Thank hey, you thanks, very much, Frank. General. Thanks, Frank. And thanks to Lori and uh, everybody out there. Thanks to all of you for, uh, for what you do and for supporting airmen and families. Okay, signing off everyone. Happy 4th of July. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.